<laughs> All right, welcome to the Collector's Catacomb, episode number three. Tonight we're going to have uh, Dan Wright with us, and he'll be talking about his antique cameras, and that should be a pretty interesting conversation, as well as he will be giving away a free antique camera to one lucky person. So we don't have uh, Chad with us tonight. He's taking a little bit of break, which is which is fine. Everybody's still got to have their family life. We all can't live on the internet. So let's. Uh, <laughs> no, we can't live on the internet. But yeah, we're just uh, you know starting episode three, and we're a group of collectors that get on here and talk about collecting and military mm -hmm. and you know antiques and old stuff and. You know, like I've said before, anything that doesn't have a barcode. So that's the focus of the show. We're going to um, start with introducing everybody, and then we'll switch over to Dan and let him have some time to tell us about antique cameras, and then we'll go into the show and tell piece with each of the panel members. So let's. Uh, I'll get started with me. My name is Eric Castle. I go by TRR, Tinker's Row Retail, or Tinker's Row Relics. Um, you can also find me on the... Allied Military Forum. I'm a forum manager over there. Always happy to have new members that want to talk about military. I've been in the reselling business since 06 and have a passion for collecting specifically military. So we'll switch over to uh, tonight. We'll start with our Master of Ceremonies, Brian. Let him introduce himself, and then we'll move on to Drew and then Elena. Hey, hi there. I'm Brian, also known as Arbitrage Alpatraz. Uh, there used to be two of me today. This morning I got rid of the other one. Don't know what was up with that. And I will be watching in the comments looking for the questions that you have for any of the panel members or the special guest. All right, okay. great, Brian. Let's uh, move on to Drew, the California Picker. Hey, guys, I'm Drew, the California Picker. And I have a channel, YouTube channel, The California, or actually California Pickin'. I have a Facebook channel called The California Picker page, anyway, fan page. And I specialize in fine art, antiques, and vintage collectibles mostly. And uh, I love to collect, buy, and sell anything old. So uh, I'm at the right place right here. So thanks for having me. All right, great. Drew, glad you could join us again tonight. Glad your uh, root, cap, root canal was finally complete. Yeah, that's <laughs> you're, nice. You're back in tip-top picking shape. Yeah. <laughs> All right, and then, of course, Elena. Hi, everyone. I'm Scrapparella. I love collecting jewelry. I love dating jewelry. I love learning about jewelry, and that's my passion. I have a YouTube channel that extends beyond jewelry. It teaches people how to be, you know, um, at home selling entrepreneurship from anything ethical that I do. So check it out, and I'm glad to be on the show. All right, great, Elena. We're glad to have you here again tonight. And then last but not least, we have Dan Wright. Hello. Go ahead and introduce yourself, Dan. Tell us a little bit about yourself, and then... Uh, We'll get right into the cameras. We're all pretty excited. We could see quite the display behind you. I don't know if that <laughs> background was on purpose or not, but it, it looks great. Uh, I had to move, like, ha half of my computer equipment and lighting equipment into my little corner <laughs> just so I could show show my little display case here. I got my – I look like a studio set up here with everything I got. Um, no, hi, my name's Dan Wright. Um, I uh, have a YouTube channel, uh, uh, Dan at More Old Stuff, and – I'll type it in the chat here, and you guys can uh, click on if you're interested in looking some of the stuff I find. Um, yeah, I do. I do. You know, buying and selling, but you know, it, it that actually came from me being a collector, and um, we, uh, you know, that's kind of how we all start. We we start finding all this stuff. We start, you know, we learn the history about things, and just what makes it fun. I don't just collect cameras. I'm talking about that tonight, but that's one of my the bigger types of collections that I have. I do a lot of other things, and I'm sure in other shows maybe I can come on and show you some other junk that, <laughs> that I got. I, but uh, uh, the, the, fun, the fun part for me, and uh, in, in a lot of the stuff that I do collect, it has a history of technology. Um, it, it, it starts, it, it's like 
you know, in the 1800s, the mid to late 1800s, America was going through a major industrial change. And I mean, for everything, this, you know, steam engines and gasoline engines and uh, technology like cameras, you know, photography, uh, uh, electricity, uh, all kinds of things were happening all at once and really fast. And <clears throat> A lot of this stuff that we collect, and a lot of stuff I collect, I love tube radios and, and old machinery and things like that, it is kind of like having your hands on that, uh, that stuff, right? Uh, you, get to, you get to see uh, how these things work. And sometimes it's, it's really ingenious to think about uh, the technology that's so simple in things like a camera. Uh, that, that you, you think, well, wow, how in the heck did this thing work? You know, now we're into the digital. they got to have computer chips, and there's got to be batteries, and there's got to be all this stuff. And, and you go, you know, wow, this is pretty complicated. But the same thing was accomplished, you know, with a box and a hole in it. And, and, and it's amazing how, how that all works. So to me, that's kind of my passion behind a lot of my collecting is the history of the technology and, uh, you know, and how people thought this stuff up and everything. So... I don't know if you want me to keep on going, uh, Eric. And no, I mean that, that's great. That's it's what we're uh, here to talk about is the history. Okay. So uh, we'll we'll lean right into uh, now that we know a little bit about you and, and your passion, obviously with cameras. You do have a, a couple of them around. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, what let's say uh, what is your favorite camera that you own, but also what is your favorite type of camera? Because I know there's several different types. Yeah. So that that for me, it's kind of easy, and that's the folding cameras, the style of camera that folds. And uh, I have I have quite a few of them, and there's many, you know, designs and types uh, of that kind. But it would be the kind of camera that the front opens up like this, and uh, you pull it out, and it has the billows in it. Uh, this particular one, and I hope you can see it pretty good. It has the billows in it. These are the kind of cameras that I really like the most, and and I think a lot of other people like these because I not because I sell these also, and that's kind of how I got started in selling was I going into my own collection. It was getting so big, and I had lots of duplicates, and I started selling them and finding that people really liked them. They don't have to work, you know. I mean, uh, if you're really into super into photography and purism, and you want to find and you can find the film or make the film in some cases for some of these cameras. You know, you can produce pictures and, and a lot of artistic uh, images from these things that are really cool. I've seen a lot of people doing that uh, lately. Uh, but these kind of cameras are great display pieces. I mean, there's this particular one. Uh, it has a red billows, which is which is kind of rare. They didn't make a lot of these kind. So to get this kind, there, there's a lot more, a little more valuable and a little more rare to hang on to. There's a lot of woodwork. Uh, let's see if the camera just right. I don't know if you can see it. Along here, there's some wood uh, and woodwork in here as part of the oh, design. Oh, that's cool. That's that's pretty fancy looking. Yeah, and there's some brass pieces. This one in particular has a, a face of brass on it. So I mean, just this by itself is it, just a great display piece. And you know, you put it in your living room on a table. It's a super conversation piece. People gravitate toward it. It kind of has that steampunk feel to it. If you're in, in, if familiar with that that the genre and the, the uh, I, I like that myself, and so this is one of the reasons I think it still has that that. Simple. This particular camera is a um, it's a Kodak 3A. Uh, Kodak the numbers 1A is a smaller size than the 3A. Now you know this is a pretty good size, pretty good size camera. Um, I like this size also for collecting because it's just really easy to see, stands out uh, better. Uh, they're not real hard to find uh, that are this rare. I mean, you can find them a lot of places, and prices vary on these things, too. Uh, this particular one was made between 1903 and uh, 1915 in that era. Um, so one of the things I thought I'd help share tonight, and I know you asked the question about my favorite camera also. Actually, my favorite camera is more... The, the cameras, the collection, and my parts of my collection that I have that belong to my family. My dad was a professional photographer. Um, he had a, a small collection himself, and uh, he passed away about three years ago. So I inherited some of his cameras. So that's my key items in my collection. They'll never go away. I'll always have them. But of course, there's an emotional tie there, right? So, uh, but I, I, I think that's that was cool, though. It's always good to have the history, you know. 
and and to have that also is instilled in me by him uh, and, and uh, photography and everything too. I think so. Uh, I one of the things I wanted to show everybody because they're uh, about these cameras, especially the folding cameras, <clears throat> is how to open them. Uh, this particular camera, I bought this camera at an auction, um, and when it when it what came up when it came up on the block, the auctioneer picked it up, and he's waving it around. I, he goes, he says, I, you know, uh, uh, this I think is a camera, and he starts going like this. I don't know, and he starts, you know, pulling on stuff, and I'm going, oh my gosh, because I knew how to open it. I had already taken a peek inside of it because I popped it open, looked to see what it was. I closed it back up, laid it down, and go, okay, I'm, I'm going to buy this, and I'm hoping no one knows how to open it or knows what it is. So as he's he's handing it around, he goes, well, and he starts handing it to people in the audience. So now I see this guy looking, and they're looking, and they're pulling, and, and the guy whips out his pocket knife, and he starts sticking it into the slots, and he's going, I'm going, oh, oh, I'm, a, I'm in the back row having a heart attack, because I figure by the time it gets to me, it's going to be cut up and bent and everything, these guys, so finally they, they auctioned, I think I got it, I got it at a really good price, and I was really happy that nobody broke it by the time I got it, so <laughs> here, here's how, here's the trick, There, it's, it's actually kind of ingenious, so there's a button, there's a hidden button, and it's hidden, I think, just out of convenience because they try to make these look really streamlined. Now, these are covered in leather. This is a thin leather cover that's over everything. So right here, now this is where the spool of thread, the spool end of the uh, spool, uh, film spool is. Underneath it here, now it's worn, so you can see it. Uh, I'm going to have to put my camera up. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah. Okay, you guys can see it. So see this little place is worn right here. Uh, that's the button that you want to look for. Now, had this be you know, brand new, you, you'd have a hard time seeing it, just a little bump right there, because a lot of little bumps all, all around this where the screws and the bolts are coming through. So right. anyhow, what you do is you squeeze that button, and it pops. Usually it'll pop right out. Sometimes they don't. And then what you do, there's this piece pulls down, and this is actually a leg. This, this is the leg. When you set the camera up, it holds it up straight, but you can use this kind of as a, as a handle to open the front of the camera out. So then you get this, you get this going like this, and it'll click into place right here. So that's how you open the door to it, right? So now you have to get the lens. There's a track along here. This track along here is how you pull the camera out so you can see the billows. Now, in here, and, in, and I, the way I'm explaining this, most of the cameras work the same way. There might be a few that the buttons are a little bit different. The, the button might be in the, a different place. Sometimes there's a little slide in the front that you, you, you crank over, and then you pull it, and it comes out, so there's no button. That's for some of the smaller ones. But anyhow, there's a there's a there's these two little buttons right here that you pinch together. So I'm going to pinch them together, and I'm kind of pulling. That releases it, and then it gets it on the slide, and then it can slide out. And then it just pulls out like this, and now you've got this. Now you've got it out. So how do you put it back? And that's another thing. Uh, when I sell these in my antique booth spaces, I have to put them in a glass case because I don't want people trying to figure out how to put it back together and end up breaking it before they buy it. So uh, <laughs> it gets, it's really it's a difficult thing to sell when you try to get people not to touch it. So anyhow, the same thing in reverse. Squeeze this. Squeeze this, it slides back up in there. Uh, now, the other tricky part, how do you close this hinge? So what you do, and I'm kind of doing it backwards, these right in here, it drops down. So I'm pushing it down, I'm pushing both down. Do you see it kind of release? It kind of released when I did that. So now there, I locked it again. I'm going to push it down. It releases it. And then you can slide this back up, and it's ready to go. And I'm closing this here. So that's how you lock That's how you lock them. Yeah, so Very I cool. Like, oh, that would be great like, for... A lot of people the next time they're at the auction, they want to take their pocket <laughs> out. And now I know, like, I'll, you go to state sales, and a lot of these are in, like, sitting in a bag. They're folded up like this, and the state sale people, they don't know what it is, or they do. They, oh, it's an old camera. They just see this. They don't know how to open it. Uh, sometimes when I'm in a group at a state sale, I just pick it up. Yeah, if it's a good price, I'm going to buy it. I'm not even going to open it up until I get it outside in most cases because I don't want people to see how it was opened up. So, you know, a little trick. And, and plus, it keeps you from breaking. If you're looking at one of these, you find one of these, or somebody, you know, has one of these, it keeps you from um, breaking one of these, you know, because this, right. this is these are old, you know. It's, a, it's an antique, and it's a, a great thing to... 
to hang on well, to. Yeah, and I mean, it, and if you're a bunch of you know antique nuts like we are, if you're sitting around with your buddies at your house drinking, you could also have a game to see who knows how to open it. You know, <laughs> as long as they don't break it. You know, that's, as long as they don't good. break it, you know. Yeah, exactly. It's like yeah. it's like a you know a parlor trick. Like, hey, check this out. I know how to open up this camera. You know. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah, do not. I, I know we're corny. <laughs> but we don't recommend you do that. <laughs> yes, no drinking and opening cameras at the same time. So well, there's a feature. Cool Joe has a question, which is okay. a, a great next one to lead into. Do you have any box cameras? Oh, yeah, I do. Matter of fact, I recommend box cameras for people who are starting out because right now they're really inexpensive, uh, and there's a lot of different kinds. Another thing, that's the other piece of this collecting, and I'm I'm going to try to talk a little bit before I have to quit here um, about. The side, the side collections that you get into from just starting with a camera. Um, there's side collections of, of uh, okay, you've got the camera. Now, now you want to find the, the original leather case that it came in, right? Because a lot of them aren't even together. It's very rare to find them together. Sometimes you can. If you do, you're lucky. This is, a, this is made by Kodak. It's got the Kodak, uh, Kodak emblem on the front of it right here. Cool. This is a, made in the 1900s. It's all made out of leather. Uh, there's a whole different, but there's all different styles of them, large and small. Um, there's other things in camera collecting that's a that's a side collection that you kind of expand off to. This these are um, this is photo sensitive paper. So this is the actual paper that pictures are printed on, right? Before you have the picture, they the the photographer buys these. This particular one was uh, it's dated 1931, and I think this one 1933. I happened to find these at some sale. Uh, th this one's a really uh, unique one because the paper, and you've probably seen these pictures around. So it's a pic. Here's what the picture would be printed on. It'd be printed on this side, and you see it's got some light damage. It's already these have been taken out of the, the bag. And they're light sensitive, and they're already. Good. But the back. And I don't know if you can see this with the glare. It's actually a postcard. Uh, I'm trying to. I don't know if you can see the letter. It says it says postcard, and it has a place for a stamp right here. So oh, cool. you get your you get your favorite pictures printed on a postcard, and then you send mail it to your friends back home or whatever. And I've right. I've seen yeah, a lot. Are, of, those are known as a. Uh, uh, RPPCs, real photo postcards. There you go. And and they. Uh, and you'll see those around a lot. You'll see those with the pictures on them around. So that's another thing. Another side collection uh, that you can do, and I, I recommend this one. I, I like it. It it's, can be a little difficult sometimes to find. might be a bit pricey. And that is displaying your cameras in a different way to display your cameras. And you see this one right here. Um, I have it on a tripod. This is a wooden tripod that was made in 1915 for antique cameras. Uh, photographers would take them out. If you could afford to buy one of these back then and you were a, a real intense photographer, you take the tripod out because you got to remember the shutter speeds on these were really slow. It was You had to hold that camera still for a long, you know, for kind of a long time. You couldn't be shaken. It didn't have the automatic uh, uh, movement sensors and all that that our digital cameras have today, right? You hit a button and now it keep, it'll automatically stabilize the picture for you. You had to hold these things really still. So you, the, the better pictures were taken when they were sitting on a tripod. This is a particular tripod that I found at a swap meet. It was completely in pieces. All the legs were taken apart. Um, and it was in a box. It was in its original box, but it, it didn't have any labels on it. And the, the person didn't know what it was. So I bought it for like a dollar. And um, I, took it, I took it and put it all back together, and I, I just kind of you know, oiled the wood up. This is the original patina that was on this when I got it. Wow. I, it has a, a patent date of 1910 on it, and it's an Eastman, it was made by Eastman Kodak. It does have a little a piece missing on the top that I have to repair. But, um, now, so, now yeah, is, that, is that all wood? Yes, this is that, all wood. And and, the entire you, thing is wood. Yes, this, these is, this is wood. All these pieces are wood. This is brass. This metal plate right here. So what the way this works is that uh, there is a let me find it down here. There's a screw down here at the bottom on each one of the legs. You see how they they go inside of each other. So this little leg. This is one leg. And this is another. This is another leg. And that's another leg. And it's a, it's a it's a, it extends. So it's a telescoping. Yeah, telescoping tripod 
and there's a little screw right here on the end that you loosen. So watch here, and then this piece comes down, so you can make it higher. And then oh, you, unscrew, so cool. you unscrew this, <laughs> and that piece comes down, right? So this is I can't show it up, but this is what you get. It's all extended <laughs> out. It's extended out. But what I like about these is, um, first of all, not very many people know what they are when they see them. Um, so sometimes they're easy to easy to purchase and easy to find. But they may, it's great for displaying your camera display. Um, I have like three or four of these in my living room. Uh, just you put them in a corner with a really nice camera on it, and now you've got your display set up. And you get more comments about that. You don't have to like put them in a case like I got back here, where you know they're behind a piece of glass, and you have to. But this you can put them in a room. You can put them in a spare bedroom. You can put them all over your house if you want to. And it's a really nice way to display to display your collection. Uh, oops. Um, so that's another side collecting thing. There's a lot more. More modern cameras, if you're collecting the do side you, of things. Dan, do you have a uh, box camera that you can show off real quick? Oh, yeah. I got one right here. Here's a box camera. And this is kind of tricky for opening also. Um, it's, it's neat to look inside of here, especially if you want to check to see if there's any film under the side collection. You might find uh, a, a, a exposed roll of film in there. You might find an unexposed roll of film in there. Uh, I'll show you one of those later. But usually they have a little latch on them. This one has, this particular one has one right here. And you just a, slip that, that down. Uh, this, this is a, yes, this is a, uh, actually, this one is a special one. I, I don't have a lot of box cameras because there's so many of them, and I try to find some some of them that are so unique. This one actually was made in England. Uh, this is made in Great Britain. Um, I'm thinking the dates, and this was about 1928, 1930, or something like that. It was made by Kodak in England. So it is a Kodak camera, and I believe it is a Brownie. Yeah, it's a Brownie Junior, it says on the front. So you undo these little latches. There is a there is a trick though. After you undo the latches, it, it doesn't want to come out. It's still stuck. Because what you have to do this, this, this the the spool winder here, you have to pull it out. It actually goes in and out. I don't know if you can see it. So there it's in. You have to pull it out so that it pulls away from the side of the box. There you go. It's a little stiff. So it pulls away from the side of the box, and then you can separate this. And this is how it comes like this. So uh, this is this is just an empty and this is all just wood. Uh, most of this is all wood. There's metal in here. This piece is usually metal. This piece is all wood, lined with a leather thin leather cover. This particular one has a really neat label on the inside of it. it says uh, you use uh, number two brownie film, known also as Kodak film, number one twenty. It's got a picture of a an old roll of film on there. So did did somebody teach you how to open all these cameras, or did you just figure it um, out? <laughs> I think I figured it out, and then once I started getting them and realizing, hey, they all work that same way, <laughs> and I kind of learned. But I've seen people do the same thing. They'll get one of these, you know, start pulling, 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 and go, oh, I guess it's broke. You know, well, no, it's not quite broke. But, or you're going to break it if you keep pulling like that. Um, this, these, a lot so of these. You can, two, write, you can almost write an ebook on how to open cameras. <laughs> you could, pretty much, yeah. So anyhow, that's a box camera, and there's different sizes. There's bigger ones. Uh, there are cameras. This one will take landscape pictures with the viewfinder here, and it will also take uh, uh, portrait pictures. And the way you take pictures with this, and a lot of people don't know that either, uh, you hold this at your waist. You have to hold it down, and you look straight down into the viewfinder to get the picture, right? And so if you're going to take a picture, I'm going to hold it up high here because you can't see it. So you look, you're holding it at your waist. You look down, and you kind of have to be in a bright environment to get the light to come through the viewfinder. So it's a basically it's a prism lens right here, and the light comes in and it and it goes up so you can see it, and you get the image that you want. And then the shutter is here on the side, and you just flick, you just flick it one time, and it takes one picture, and then you wind it till you watch on the back. There's a little red uh, window. You can see it here, a little red window that you can see the film number from the film come through, and you wind it to the next one. And you hold it down at your waist. I have a lot of people will pick these up and they'll start looking like this. How do you how do you take this picture? You hold it you hold it down at your waist and you look straight down when you take pictures with this. So um, that's a box camera. So do you still take any pictures with any of them? Uh, <laughs> no, I don't. I played with some ideas of 
because I had a lot of these at one time. I played with some ideas of, of inserting a digital camera in one of these and using the lens, the original lens, where there's really no lens, it's just a piece of glass, because this is just a pinhole, basically. Uh, and it lets a certain amount of light in in a certain amount of time, right straight on the on the film, boom, and then it's done. But I was thinking about what well, would be kind of cool. It'd be like kind of like a steampunk uh, camera, I guess. You know, you try to you could get a digital camera. Now there are some people that are doing that. I found a couple companies. They're very expensive because it takes a lot of custom work to get the, the parts of a digital camera inside of something like this. But I don't know. I just thought it'd be fun. You can still right. buy film. Or you can buy 120 film and 620 film. Uh, the gift camera that we'll be giving away uh, actually takes 620 film, and you can still purchase 620 film. You can't go to like the your Walmart or whatever to buy it. You're going to have to buy it online. I know that people on eBay are selling it about $25 for 12 pictures, something like that. They wow. re-spool it. They re-spool it onto the the 620 spool. 120 film and 620 film is the same width, uh, it, just that the original spools are different. The spool okay. hub size are thinner or thicker. 120, I think, is thicker than the 620, which is right. thin. Well, and I've even see a, seen a, a reemergence of tintype photography. Oh, yeah. Um, actually, you know, I, I've been doing photos for a long time, but I've just been seeing it in the last year or so. Some of the, um, you know, I guess I would probably say college kids are the ones bringing it back, but doing a lot of the tent yeah. photography. I have sold a lot of older cameras that two two artists, and that's their goal was to get to get the camera uh, that's in working order and and try to take pictures orig in, in the original format that they were like the the six inch three by six inch three by five inch formats and and try to take pictures that way. But um, there's a lot of artists that are that are that are going back to that. And I've sold a lot of cameras, these guys. And the only thing in, in like a one of the folding cameras, um, this particular one takes, um, I think it was 616 film. It's a huge formatted film. As you see, here's the here's the uh, spool, which is, okay, this is the, let's get out here without breaking it. Um, I should take this out earlier. So let me just show you. I don't know if you can see it here. This is the this big camera that I showed you. That's the spool for the film. This is a 620 spool. Uh, everything's black on black, so I know it's going to be kind of hard to see. So it's about about two thirds of the width. So this is pretty good. This is a big picture. This is a big piece of film. Oh, there is something uh, before, before we go too much farther here. I, I want to remember to include this because it's this is a really cool thing too. It's kind of about the technology of the day. So you know, you're taking pictures. There's something about this particular camera, why I'm hanging on to this one, uh, is they made cam. They had a really unique idea, and they sold it to um, uh, architects and um, uh, geologists. Uh, so when they were out in the field, or appraisers, insurance appraisers, it was kind of sold to them initially. So when you, you by the way, um, this is called... The uh, number three A folding pocket camera. This is a pocket camera, okay? <laughs> and the reason why it was a pocket camera because it would actually fit in your coat pocket. It fits into your side coat pocket when you carry it, right? So that's how they advertise it as a pocket camera. But that if you're out taking a picture for your business, say for insurance purposes or an architect, and you, you have a hard time remembering what pictures you took of what until you get them developed and you go, man, you know, which, what was that? This particular camera and a lot of them, these are called the autographic camera. And what it meant was that you could autograph the picture. With the autographic camera, you could write on the film, the original negative film, while you're taking the picture so that when it was developed, you would see on the negative an inscription of whatever you wrote. And so you could identify each picture. So what makes this camera uh, very unique is it has a metal pen that's in here. You slide this piece down. If I can do it, I'm trying to cover it too base. Oh, maybe that was going to happen. It just sits in there. You slide this piece down. Uh, the pen is inside of here, so I've got the pen right here. It's just a steel pen. It's it's actually uh, has a deck. It's decorative, 
on the end. I don't know if you can see it. Let me see if I can hold it up there. You can see it. See, it's got a little decoration on it and a little end on it, and it's got a point on this end. You open this little box right here. This little slot opens up. Now the film is on the other. It's right on the inside of here. It's the back side of the film, and it's also the edge. It's between the pictures is where this is at. So once you've got your film lined up and you're on the right number, then you take your pen and you write in here, you know, you know, uh, my backyard or whatever, or you write somebody's name, Elena. This is the picture of Elena, and you write her name in there, right? And it's it's scra basically you're scratching it onto the film itself. So then, uh, you know, you can you can set now. Unfortunately, I have some negatives that have inscriptions on them from an autographic, but I dug all over the place and I cannot find those things or anything. I'm now I'm really up, like nervous about where's this thing at. I'm gonna go find I'm gonna find those negatives somewhere. I know I got a box of them, but it's really interesting, really cool technology. I mean, here you get to note notate your pictures as you take them, right? As you take them. So that's what that's what's unique about this. And you might see some of the cameras actually are labeled on the camera name as an autographic camera. Um, so. Is there any other questions? I do have a couple more things, and I can go on and on. I don't want to take up the whole show, which we no, we have. we have a we definitely. I mean, if you have some other things to share, that's great. I'm curious as to uh, what's the oldest camera that you own. Um, I own a camera from 18. I believe it's this one here. Um, this is about an 1890s uh, uh, Kodak camera. And it uses, I don't know if we can see it here. It uses, I don't have the back plate on this. It did not use uh, uh, gel film or the plastic film. It used, it used a, a, a glass plate as a negative that would fit in here. The cover, the back cover is missing. I got this one. So um, it used like a glass plate. They would make a, they would make a glass plate. I have another camera here that's a German camera. It's a little smaller. It's the same idea. Um, and this one is from the 1920s. But what it does is the, the uh, it uses a plate. So it has like, this one has like a cartridge. And you put, now this was not a glass plate. Um, this was not a glass plate. Uh, Negative. It was a. They used. They they made the celluloid type film, but there were individual negatives already pre-cut, and they would put like a pack of five inside of here, and then you would put it in the back of the camera, and you pull the divider out between them, between the picture, and then you would take the picture. You put the divider back in, and then you would take this to your dark room, and you would take the film out in the dark room and develop the film that way. That same process is what. Um, was used with the glass plates too. The glass plates. Now, this is what made uh, George Eastman really famous of is Eastman Kodak. What, is that what Drew is holding up on the glass? Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's, a glass that's, a, that's a that's a glass negative. So what they did for that is they would take that piece of glass and they would cover it with a chemical, a wet chemical. It was called. It was like a wet negative process. They put that into a camera. And they'd have to take the picture within a certain amount of time where that chemical would dry out. So they'd take the picture, and they'd have to go develop it pretty quick, too, or the chemical would eat away the glass and eat away the image. or the, uh, the, the stuff. So it was, a, it was a really difficult process back in before 1879. Because about 1879 is when George Eastman developed the, the cellular process of using a plastic, a, a, a gelatin process, I guess they called it, where he was using a, a plastic film uh, for, for, for a film negative. And so, uh, and he did it like this with the, with the single images, single pieces of negative that you put in the back of this camera, and you take your picture, you take the cartridge out, you take the cartridge over to your, your dark room, and you develop the cartridge into a negative. I have a lot of tricks about that because I have found lots of those negatives, and like, like Drew, like, see that? That, that negative that Drew's showing right now, um, if you if you put that on your scanner, a lot of scanners have uh, reverse you know uh, imaging on it. You can scan that and re it'll reverse it from negative to positive, and then you can print out that picture. So you'll know exactly what the picture looked like, or you can see at least in a digital digital form on your screen. Um, I find a lot of old negatives, and I've been able to do that. And there's some great 
images. I mean, steam locomotives with steam company, you know, smoke coming out, stuff that it's just amazing that that's there. There is the original image of that event happening, you know, and that, that's another 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 side piece of collecting cameras is collecting pictures <laughs> and negatives and all that kind of stuff. So you can go right. on and on. Well, to get back to the uh, the autographic real quick, uh, Kim had a question. Would you label the picture before or after taking it? <laughs> um, I think you would. I think it's while you take it. So whatever picture is in ready to be taken. So number one, I think you would just. So I, I guess it's in between after the first picture would would be. I guess the easiest way to explain it. The first. First picture would be in ready, you know, queued up. Number you'd see number one down in the down in the little red window down here. Down here is where you'd see number one. So you got picture one, and then you'd go up here and you'd write the name of, of picture number one. So the picture is actually right. sitting there. Okay. You probably yeah. have to manually wind it too, correct? Yes. So you would yes. you would write what it was right before yep. you manually wind yep. it. And then you wind it. If you start winding it and you forget to write. Forget it. There's no rewind. <laughs> you got to remember your pictures. Yeah, you'd wind the picture as you go through. Just a quick <laughs> reference, though. I'm going to put this on the on the file section on the uh, uh, collector's catacomb. Um, it's a it's a PDF file. Uh, it's actually it's called the history of uh, Kodak cameras, and it's a list of all the Kodak cameras that were made from, uh, I think it's like 18, 1878 or 79 or 1880 up to like the 1990s, 1999 or something like that. It's a neat reference um, only because it, in most cameras you don't know how old they are. So what's a, the neat, the coolest reference is it tells you when they made them from most most of the Kodak cameras were made over a period of time, like four, three years, four years. Some of them were made over a ten-year period. The same camera was, and so you can kind of look at that and get an idea of how old your camera is. Um, uh, it also tells you the film size that the camera uses, and it has the original list price for the camera. Uh, I think when I looked, I was this particular one that I was showing you here. I think it sold originally. In uh, 1903, for $79. So I can imagine. I don't know what the wow. calculation to today's money is, but that's probably about $500 or something like that. You know, in 1903 money to $79 to now, it's it's quite a bit. So not everybody could afford to buy one of these cameras. It'd be us trying to go. You know, I, I really want to buy a. Um, Oh, what's that digital? What's the digital one you can like hook and do everything with? Everybody's taking pictures of it. You can hook it on your digital like, SLR. No, it's that. What's the one they do a lot of action stuff with? The little uh, tiny GoPro. One. The GoPro. They're like five hundred bucks, right? So it'd be like buying a GoPro today. <laughs> right. You know, this way. But anyhow, I'll, 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 I'll load this file up for everybody to look at. It's a great. It's a great file, and you know, if you're collecting cameras, you kind of if you have cameras and you want to kind of look them up and see. Of course, you can always Google stuff. There's a ton of sites for finding ages, and that's just Kodak cameras, right? We're not talking about Ansco, uh, Burke. Um, there's a bunch of other. During the 1920s, there was a lot of camera companies that were in the United States. There's also then foreign cameras. There's a lot of German cameras um, that Has were made. Hasselblad. Hasselblad. Yeah, uh, this particular one that I was showing you with the slide out. This is a German. Um, this is a German Zeus Icon camera. Um, this particular one is. So there is a lot of. Uh, I mean, you could just you could just go and go, <laughs> go and go. Right. So, uh, well, real quick, we got one more question. I don't want to miss questions if we don't have okay. to. Um, sure. Cool Toads, Sean. Which, hey, what's up, Sean? Wants to know what's up with multi-lens cameras. Multi-lens. Um, wonder wonder what he means. Oh, you mean like the the dual. The dual reflex cameras. I, I think he's talking about I'm the thinking. lens that. I think he's talking about the lens that rotates on the front of the camera. <clears throat> well, a lot of movie know, cameras. Might be because they, don't they have box cameras that have more than one lens on the front? Yeah, a little like two over under. Uh, let me see. Let me go into chat. Well, two lenses on an over under kind of configuration. Well, yeah, that's a that's a reflex camera. Uh, I don't have one of those. 
right here handy. Um, what that what that did is that one of the lenses was your was your viewing. It's the, it was your viewing, so you could see, you could target your 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 image for your your for your person. The other one was the actual lens that took the picture. Because you think about you think about looking at this. Okay, you're looking out this hole. So what you see here is coming from this hole. The camera is actually taking the picture from here. So I wonder how how accurate were pictures. If you look at a lot of old pictures, and I know Eric, you collect pictures too, you'll see people's heads cut off, or you know, you'll see kind of off oh, to yeah. the side, or you'll see because they're they're probably really targeting here, right? But then there may be off just because of this distance right here it might be off. So right. uh, the and reflex no redos. <laughs> you, yeah. you, you know what though, honestly, if they can come up with all these high tech super genius ways to keep a camera locked and shut, I think they can figure out how to tilt yeah. the aim to aim properly. Yeah. Well, they did get it, well, you can imagine, they did get it good. I mean, they got it really good. If you look at a lot of the old pictures that I've seen, there, some are really good pictures, yeah. you know. Well, I um, have a reflex camera. Um, I just don't know where it's at. I have I have one here. Because it was just cool looking, you know. I mean, it's all about money in the end. I have one here that's, that's just, you, this is kind of a unique one. Um, it's a 3D camera. I've seen those before. So what it does is it actually takes two pictures. Right, it's taking two pictures. So is, that one, to, is that to create the old stereo view cards? Um, it can't, yes, yes, it's a, because it's, a, it's called a stereo vivid camera. So it is for taking, it's for, and it creates that 3D effect when you're looking at, at right. the two. So it is for, for taking that. That's what this is. Right. You know what photos I'm talking about there, the two photos yeah. on the card, and you put it yeah. in a viewer, and you, you look through it, and it gives you a put the card in there. Yeah, that's what this does. This creates that kind of yeah, effect. They're real popular for World War One photographs, believe it or not. Um, I have quite a few of, like, soldiers marching and parades and stuff, and it's 3D technology from the 1920s, you know? Yeah. This is another there camera. There you go, right there. There we he's go. Probably, There's. Uh, oh, he's probably got one. Drew's got one. There you go. Oh yeah, he's he's got all. I don't know how he <laughs> does it. He's got all this stuff at his fingertips. <laughs> and it's all right there. He just like reaches. I, I think over. he's got an elf under the desk <laughs> fetching this stuff. <laughs> this is this one. This is a World War II camera. This one was used uh, in the military. It's a Kodak camera. It's called a Medalist. Um, it's heavy. This is a heavy camera. It's a 35 millimeter camera. Uh, oh, maybe not. Wait a minute. No, it's. I'm sorry. It's a 620 camera. It's a 35. It's a 620 camera, and um, this one actually belonged to my father, so this is what I'm hanging on to. But I've had others of these, and uh, they're highly sought after because they have multiple collectible genres, right? They're co they're camera collector kind of thing, but they're also military. Uh, so military collectors like to include these in their collection also because of the because of the the era that it was in. But these were used in. Uh, during the war. Very heavy duty, man. This thing could get banged around and <laughs> this is plastic right here. Uh, but this whole thing is made out of aluminum and it's pretty steady, pretty heavy duty all the way around. Some steel on the bottom which feels really heavy there. That's great, man. And well, I, I hate to cut you off because I'm really... No, <laughs> no I know. I'm, but, I can uh, go on, on and on, but I'll let you... Hey, uh, and you know what? We'll have you on again. I know you have more stuff that you collect, so, you know... It's cool. always, well, thanks for always fun to hear about new things, and you know we're not going to run you off. I'd love for you to stick around and, and hang out. And oh, sure. I, I'm sure Drew has a slew of things to show us tonight. And oh, I want to see what Drew's got. Yeah, I know he's uh, always good. has always got something good, and then I've got some history lessons on uh, the parachutist badge that I showed last week. Cool. So, but we well, do thanks. really appreciate you coming out and talking about your cameras. But well, we thanks, have one thanks more thing you got to show off, and that's oh, the camera yeah. that you're giving away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Eric's going to determine how how this is given away. So this is this is what I'm giving away. It's a it was a, it's a 1940. These were made from 1948 to 1951. It's called a, a tourist. It's in a box. It's got the original box. Yeah, box got a little, couple dings in it, but you know, uh, this is the camera that's in here. Actually has the all the original paperwork. It's got a manual, little manual on how to take pictures. Um, 
and it's got a manual on the on the camera itself. A couple other odd, odd little pieces of paper. There's a paper around here on how to use the flash, and then there's some kind of a, a mailing label that's inside here that's a real old one. So it's kind, it is kind of cool. It's got a, little, a lot of little pieces, and that's another part, side effect, side piece of collecting cameras. You can get the original boxes, if you can get the manuals. Um, there's manuals for all these, these 3A, the big one I showed. They made a little paper manual, and I have a collection of those too. Film canisters, rolls of film. But anyhow, this is the... Open it. It's a, actually a folding camera. Folds out like this, and this is it. Here's here's the shutter. The shutter is actually down here on the on the side thing. That's it. I'm leaving the panel so I can enter these contests every week. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't you have another name you can log in with? Come on, Atlanta. Use another account. <laughs> I have morals. <laughs> <laughs> you do. That's why I like. We it. are getting some cool giveaways, though, huh? So yeah, I mean. Uh, Drew's yeah, going to do so the selection I mean, and or, or put really out the task. The kind of stuff that will get people started collecting cameras. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's keep a, this it's history great, alive, you know. Yeah, it's a great way to start. You know, it's a, it's easy to get going with this stuff. And right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what we'll do is um, the video after the show's off will stay on YouTube. And uh, we'll go off of a, a random individual that will be selected by the numbers from the uh, comments. So you're going to need to to leave a comment on the video to uh, enter for this contest. And now we're not going to have a show next week or on the 1st of January. But what I'll do is I will release a, a winner video just real quick on uh, Christmas next week of who the winner is. So that way uh, you can go ahead and whoever the winner is can get a hold of us. And the winners from last week, um, your stuff will get mailed out this week. I've been in Seattle, so sorry I didn't get to it <laughs> until I got back home now. And then uh, before the end of the show tonight, we'll also announce the winner from, uh, uh, from last week's second prize based on the uh, comments up until the start of the show tonight. So that's uh, that's how we're going to do that one. And Dan, we really appreciate you uh, offering up that camera. I mean, that's that's great. And oh, hopefully, the uh, happy recipient, whether it's uh, Elena's faux account or not, <laughs> <laughs> I'll know what state to get shipped to. So I know where she lives. <laughs> don't don't forget to unclick Dan. I think I did. Did I unclick him? Oh, okay. Just yeah. making sure because the he's okay. It's working now on the other chat. I know. We really need to click on you because you're the center of the show. No. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter who whoever's not talking doesn't you know it doesn't do well for the viewers to watch. <laughs> I know, and I'm I, I think I've gotten better at it by the third show now. The first show was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> but uh. Yeah, so Dan, again, you know, we really appreciate it. We're going to get into our, our panel members, uh, the ones that aren't taking vacation, mm -hmm. you know, because it's not like Chad doesn't live in Florida and on vacation all the time. <laughs> but uh, we'll start tonight with Elena. If she's Or actually, you know what, oh, pause that. Brian, let's do some uh, shout-outs since we didn't have any breaks tonight already. Who's in the, uh, the chat this evening? I'm going to kick all the way back to the beginning here. We have Kim out there. Of course, you got Cool Toad, Sean. He's out there. Let's see. Ooh, it keeps moving and freezes. <laughs> I got Maureen, the free pile picker. Laura Lee's out there. Riesel Ronan. And there's Dan again. Just kind of scrolling through. Earlier we had a member from the UK looking at us. Sam's pickups and buys. Hey, that's days. cool. I'm always happy to have uh, our our UK collector friends on. I've got several friends over in the UK. Hopefully, I'm trying to convince a few to get on the show one night. I'll I'll tell you what. These are hardcore viewers right now because it's right before oh, Christmas. Boy. It's holidays. And there was not many announcements, and so thank you so much, everyone, 
who's watching. In yeah, few, it's, two, it's two in the it's two in the morning in England, <laughs> no. right? In a few more, there's Dana Bostic. He, said he has a tourist too sitting right in front of him. Oh, and there we go. Yeah, he just I spoke a little bit of cameras with him uh, about a week or so ago. He said he picked up some. I think he was sending them in the FBA. And then you got Mark Welker. I believe that's all I see for right now. Well, we really do appreciate the viewers and, you know, the hardcore ones. I think they get to, uh, they're notified about the best giveaway we've had yet. So, uh, you know, somebody, snoozers somebody are going to lose out. <laughs> somebody just mentioned about uh, testing, testing cameras for like resale. Um, you know, if you're, if you're going to resell these kind of things, uh, a lot of times you don't have to really worry about to, because most people understand that they're that they're old and that there's no there's, you know, they're probably not even going to find film for it. But it's it's wise to put in there that it's been untested, has never had pictures, you've never taken pictures with it. Um, what I like to do is I open the back <clears throat> and look through the billows from the back to just to check to see if there's any light leaks coming through the billows. And if I do see light leaks, I will I will put that in in the description um, or tell someone that yeah I you know I've checked it and I see that there's probably some tiny pinholes in the billows so that's not good you have to patch those holes before you get too much light in there if you're going to use it, if you're going to try to use the camera right okay, have you ever cool. have you ever heard of anybody like staging like an antique scene and like putting in like an antique item they're trying to sell but it's not antique and then using like an old old camera and developing the film and being like I got proof oh. <laughs> I don't well, you know, know. <laughs> you, you know those guys those guys who report UFO things and they want to say that you know oh yeah I took this picture back in you know 1952 and whatever they actually go and they buy the film and the camera and they try to re they try to get get everything that's to say, yeah, here's a picture of an alien I saw on my farm in, you know, 1948, you know, and, and they, they actually go to the, all the work to finding the camera that's of the era, the film, the everything. <laughs> right. Elena, if you check out some of those modern tintype artists, you, you would be blown away because, honestly, they're, doing, they're using the same chemicals, the same methods, yep. and other than the scenes that they're photographing, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. Yeah, wow. You know, I now I've never held one. I would assume when it comes to that, honestly, um, I would think the smell would be the giveaway because you you don't smell the chemicals on the old tin types, and I would think that on the new ones you wouldn't be able to get rid of that smell for quite a long time. You know, that and there's a bit of a patina on old tin types because that that finish that it leaves, you know, at, over years, gets a little yellowish. It actually turns darker. Pictures right, well, that darker. and the crazing. You'll see a lot yeah. of crazing on it. So you, you could see that in a, an old, a true, a you know, real old, you know, tintype versus one that was, you know, reproduced. Yeah, so, but let's uh, let's get moving on from cameras here, and, and I know Elena's got itching to show us some jewelry this hey. week. Is that what we have this week, Elena? Yes. Some more jewelry. <laughs> all right. Well, it's all yours. Okay. I um, I only have three items here that I want to show, but these three items um are pretty easy to identify once you know um what they look like. So, let me show you the first one. Now, this is a little squirrel. I love him. He's so adorable. But that's not what I'm trying to show you. I'm trying to show you the pattern. It's called, oh, and please forgive me if I mispronounce it. I'm queen at mispronouncing things. But filigree, Drew, Drew usually corrects me if I mispronounce anything. But um, filigree. Oh, that again? The filigree. The yeah, wo that's it. You got it. The woven. Can you guys see that? How it's woven, the metal? I don't know if you guys are actually seeing the filigree in this. Yeah, the Can detail. You... Yeah, it's kind of lost a little bit. Yeah, well, pretty much what filigree is, and I'm going to read from my notes directly in how 
um, I've researched it, but it's it's just woven over and over and over again. And the filigree design in this piece was very popular in the Art Nouveau era. The Art Nouveau era is between 1890 and 1915. Um, the process in actually making this circular spiral pattern came about in the 18th century. Okay, 18th century, that's 1700s. The technique, which is called quilling or paper filigree, was an art that was practiced by the ladies of quality. Back then, paper was hard to come by, so it was never wasted. It was used down to the sliver in which was turned into artwork. So basically, this design, you know, way back when, when they just started to figure out how to make paper, you know, it, it just not anybody could find paper, so they did not waste anything. And they would, you see artwork in frames that the paper slivered this way. I'm going to turn this around. Maybe you can see it better. And if you guys can chime in, let me know if you can actually see that spiral pattern that I'm referring to. But if you can't see it, just know filigree or look up quilling or paper filigree and you'll see the spiral pattern. Now, this piece, I also look at the hinge. There's a clasp and this clasp, the, the little piece right here, okay, is on the inside. Well, this piece came out in 1890s and still made today. But that is good to see a class that was made during that time. We have the filigree. And this piece happens to be stamped 800 as well. What 800 is, it's silver. But it's not 92.5% 92, silver. It's only 800% silver. And it also has maker's marks that are from the country Italy. Well, when researching marks from Italy for the mark, and I hope I'm not talking too much, you guys are with me, but 800 mark on, um, was used between 1872 and 1933 in Italy. Um, in 1934, new statues were issued in Italy. One of the changes were um, that 800 and 925 were marked in an oval, um, oh, I'm not going to pronounce that, cartouche. 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 <laughs> Thank you. And the way this is, this is stamped, it, is, um, it dates between 1872 and 1933. So this helps date the piece to the Art Nouveau era. So basically he is 100 years old. Cool. I got a question about the clasp. You said that came out in about 1890. Now, I know in military, um, you don't see that clasp come about until about the late 20s, early 30s, and it's referred to as uh, like a, a roller clasp or a jeweler's clasp. Is that the same thing in, in jewelry? Do they talk about it in that sense? Well, there's two different type of clasps that look like this. And, and they look the same, but they're different. This piece right here, this, this piece is in the center. I don't know if you can see that. The right. piece that opens and closes in the, is in the center. There's another piece that on the outside, it, it overlaps, and you turn it up and down. The okay. overlap didn't come until um, World War II, so 1940s. Okay. So, so and that's usually the cheaper made pieces with with the overlapping, which may be another segment, another. <laughs> right. Yeah, I was just curious because like all the um, the World War One era um, pins and stuff like that are all the open sea catch. They don't use any of the jeweler's clasp or catches on them. So they I was just curious about that. The differences between military insignia and jewelry at the time. Well, they're pretty much the same. It all boils down to the manufacturer and the makers that were making it. The class that were available to be made back then were the C clasps and these rollover clasps and the safety pins. Those are the three type of class you're going to see during that 
World War One or earlier time period of right around 1890. Okay, cool. Yeah, and um, that's that's this one. So I love him. He's awesome. A hundred years old. Come on, people don't even live to be this old. And look at him. He's gorgeous. And oh, I don't know I'm if gonna, you can see I'm that. I'm gonna live forever. <laughs> I don't know if you can see the enameling <laughs> on him, but he's just really precious. I'm, I'm, right. I'm planning on using my insurance just to replace parts along the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that reminds me of that one movie, but I don't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> um, my next one that I'm really excited about okay, is this ugly-looking green plastic necklace, which is not plastic. It's ambroid. And what Ambroid is, it is amber mixed with celluloid. Now, this is the second one that I have found that hasn't been in just a normal, natural amber color. This is green, and the other one I found was purple. And I love, I mean, this is just one of those pieces I love finding. And they usually have, like, this glazed look, like flaking going on on the outside. But basically... What this is, is they were manufacturing amber in the Art Deco, usually around there, um, 1920s, 1930s. And they were playing around with trying to create amber by mixing some of it with celluloid and creating these, these beads. One of the ways to test to see if this is ambroid is a little piece of toilet paper and hopefully I can do this um, without breaking the necklace. <laughs> but if you, uh, you probably can't see what I'm doing. If you um, it rub it, and I... Does it have to be Charmin? What? <laughs> Does it have to be Charmin? 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 Don't squeeze uh, the Charmin? I don't... Toilet I, paper? Uh, okay. No, I, I'm sorry. I don't know my toilet paper brands. <laughs> <laughs> Ask me something about jewelry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, I use Angel something soft. Okay. Angel soft. This, yeah, this is Angel soft, but no, it doesn't matter. But basically, Amber, when, oh, oh my gosh, I'm not even going to be able to pronounce it tonight. But basically, Amber is very has electric, static, whatever. And um, so when you rub the beads, celluloid, regular plastic, lucite, fake light will not create that static electricity. Amber does. So this piece is creating that static electricity. So I know that it is made with amber. The fact that it's green makes it really easy to know that it's mixed with celluloid because um, green and amber is really, really rare, and you're, you're not going to find it like this and in perfectly shaped beads. Or else That's interesting. That's interesting that it would stick to uh, amber because amber is a natural product. Doesn't it come from uh, fossilized sap of a tree? Correct. Over millions of years old. Wow. <laughs> you know, so and celluloid was, you know, made around the 1850s, somewhere around there, um, yeah. and and amber. So it's pretty neat. So here's another piece that's old, and if you look at the clasp. It's a box class, and these class were stopped being used in 1950s, so everything about it helps date the piece to the Art Deco. And the Art Deco, the 1920s, 30s, was all about shapes. It was about the circles, the triangles, and you did see a lot of graduated beads um, during the Art Deco period. So do you, do you think that's Art Deco, but then made in the 50s? Is that what you're saying? No, 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 no. It's definitely 1920s, 1930s. I'm thinking 1920s. Um, okay, but, the, but class, the, cl the class could be used up into the 50s. That is correct, yes. If, um, if this necklace was graduated like this, but I was able to determine it was Lucite, Lucite wasn't made until 1940s. <laughs> So I would know that this was a more retro mid-century piece versus an antique deco piece. You know, there's a lot of different things that go into play in helping date an unsigned piece. So, and that's just very another. cool. And you my always, last, you always have something great to show us. 
My last one, really quick, and I won't take up any more time. I won't even talk very long about this. Any little pens or pencils that have a little top right there usually were for chantelaines, like before purses, pretty much. You know, it would be a brooch hanging on. I believe I talked about it in the first okay. episode. So I'm just showing another example. This one's a little bit later because it's a nice little pen. But that's about is it. That a, is that a pen or a shank? Oh, I don't know. It's, it looks like a pen to me. <laughs> I, I know it attaches to a chandelier. That's what I focus on. It's it's a pen, though. It's a Waterman's Ideal Fountain Pen. That's good. Okay, yeah. cool. Water, yeah. yeah, Waterman's a good, definitely a good maker. Yeah. Now, have you dated that one? Have you gone look through the Waterman stuff to see if you could date it to a specific, a specific era? I meant to before this show, but I haven't done it yet. But usually, any Chantelaine is early early twentieth century or or later. Right. Well, cool. I actually um, there's a a guy here in that lives near me that's a, a friend that's big into pens, and I'm going to try to talk to him to come onto the show. He actually runs the Boston Pen Show once a year. Oh, cool. I'll, just, I'll have to hold on to this for a little bit longer. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm going to try to get him on, hopefully, our first show of 2015. But uh, we're not going to have any shows for the next two weeks. Okay. So that way it gives everybody some, <laughs> some time off. <laughs> well, next week, to, next week is Christmas, and then the following Thursday is New Year's, so... That would be an interesting show if we did do one. <laughs> yeah, I don't think anybody would either be recovered yet or sober. Yeah. So I may, su I may surprise you guys. Stuff. We'll see. <laughs> so we'll move on over to Drew. Thank you, Elena. Thanks, what do you Elena. have, Drew? Well, speak of the devil here. Let's see. That's a vintage Waterman style fountain pen. It's some type of celluloid that's uh, like cracked ice. And this one happens to be a wall, W A A, sorry, W A H L. Probably not coming into view too well because I don't know. Are you guys seeing it? Yeah. Hello? Okay. So anyways, these have uh, you got to look for this nib, guys, because sometimes these are gold. Yeah, I've seen them with 14 karat gold. Yeah, I think this might be one of those, so we'll just have to see. I don't know. It's a wall number two, and it's a really nice color, olive green. Getting back to the uh, photography, I was kind of chomping at the bit when you guys were talking about this. <laughs> oh, that's There's cool. a tin type. Yeah. And there's that old that's that old finish that you're talking about. Yeah. Right. Very faded. This is probably now, eight. Does he eight. have any uh any medals or anything on his chest? No, I wish he was military. Uh it doesn't look that like he is, but he's wearing a bowler hat, so um but he looks like one of those Smith Brothers guys way back. You know the cigar people? <laughs> right. It kind of looks like that, but this is an early tin type. Yeah, and that's great. Have, What's the size on that? This is a uh, three by four and a half, something like that. Okay, cool. That's and just, then we're moving just standard size. Yeah, I, I've shown that before, but not on the collector's catacomb. This is an interesting one. This is a daguerreotype, I believe. Uh, and what's interesting about this one, I have a video showing uh, showing this item. And what I found with this item is they're usually double-sided. So the man is on one side and the woman is on the other side. And they take them and they travel with them. Um, and they're usually in these kind of Early plastic, I don't know, that's probably some seriously early type of plastic or Is that good a purchase? Of, uh, yeah, it's beautiful. It's Victorian. Look at that. 
Yeah, yeah but is that that plastic is that gouda percha? I, I, might, I not, might not be pronouncing that right, but it looks like gouda percha or something. Yeah, and I believe they call they call those union cases. Uh huh. You see a lot of great Those Civil War. Uh, if you're lucky, you find some Civil War photographs. But look at this one, guys. This is a nice little surprise. So <clears throat> I just had half of it. It just I I didn't have the other half. But there was a crack in it, and I thought, what the hell is it? This is about the crack. And I looked at the crack, and I saw there was another photograph under there, you guys. Now look what I found. I took this out live on camera. I took this one out. She kind of looks like Lizzie Borden to me. I don't know about, you know? I'll just have to do some hey, research. Everybody's got their twin out there. But some of my viewers said that they thought that this person looked like who, who, somebody who's famous. Ah, look at that. So chances are it probably got dropped and broke, and they just stuck the other photo in with that one. Is that a guy or a girl? That's a man. That's a man. Okay, I wasn't sure if that was cleavage or a white shirt underneath. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know oh, what? Yeah. The women did look very manly back then, what? so I don't blame you. But uh, I thought this kind of got this guy kind of looked like Henry Clay Harrison or, yeah, one of the presidents of the United States. I'm not sure it would be great if it was. It, you know what? It looks to me like Jefferson Davis or something. I've seen some of those... Yeah, it, it looks familiar. <laughs> he's got a real, he's got a real drawn-in uh, jawline. The, you know, real high cheekbones. I'm gonna have to do some more research on that one, but that was pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Then, well, that's pretty um, neat to find stuff behind there. You know, it's oh, yeah. always, but it's like then a treasure moved, hunt and a treasure hunt, you know. Then we move to a uh, a really interesting find of history. Uh, this is a this is how you used to get your diploma in high school and it's in a nice suede case and this one's from what does that say Neodisha Neodisha I probably pronounce this pronouncing that but class of 1920 and real nice diploma you guys um, I got this in a uh, along with a um, a photo album of this lady's life. Her whole life was in this photo album, along with her diploma here from this high school. And this happens to be her. And oh, her, <laughs> I know, like she's not. It's not really risque, but it's just a little sexy. Her name was. Right. Uh, her name was. Um, Pauline Atlas was her ma uh, married name for ma her her uh, her married name, and her maiden name was Pauline Stifler. And the funny thing of that was in this album was I pulled out so much stuff in this album, you guys. I found a 1954 or six. Uh, uh, what was it? A program from the uh, Oscars, the Academy oh. Awards, and oh, cool. it was pretty amazing to find that in this album. Another great thing I found in this album was this. This is some ephemera for you here. This is a uh, a dinner, the diamond dinner of these uh, sports writers back in what was that? 1953. And on the let's see inside the program, it tells you what you're gonna have for dinner that night and all that stuff. I love I love menus and that sort of thing. Um, and then we got some celebrities there on the side, George Goebel and, uh, and the the entertainment for the evening. Oh, cool. And what and one of the honorees is right here, somewhere right. Well, anyway, one of the honorees was a guy named Hank Sawyer, and this is Hank Sawyer, famous MVP baseball player. 
he played with like three different teams. And this is Hank Sawyer playing with uh, Willie Mays, here with Willie Mays, here with Henry Aaron, and uh, 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 Banks. And this guy was a major famous baseball player, you guys. And on the back of this menu was an autograph to this woman right here back in 1953. And Hank Sawyer signs it a little nice little blurb to her and signs his autograph. Cool. Oh, that's yeah. really very cool. Yeah. That's a good find. <laughs> that's nice. Um, let's see what else. And then staying on the sports topics, uh, let's see. You got um, football cards. And these are vintage football cards from 1960 and 61, I believe. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Now that's not just, that's not it, just because there's another one. And that's not all because there's another one. Oh my god. <laughs> so three, three so three <laughs> from from New York. And then we have San Francisco. More team cards. Is that focusing? Come on. Come on, camera. And if that wasn't enough, another forty nine Niners card. <laughs> Wow. And I can just tell you guys that there are more Cleveland Browns, Detroit Lions, <laughs> Baltimore Colts, all from 1960 and 61. And that was in a photo album? No, this was I bought this separately from the other lady oh, stuff. Okay, I thought you I thought you had the gold mine in a photo album. No, <laughs> no, but I I probably pulled out. Uh, I sold that uh, Oscars program for over a hundred dollars, and then there's photographs for days in there. Anyway, that's my little collection. I mean, I didn't nice. just find one of these cards. I found a stack. <laughs> that's cool. That's so that's cool. cool. Then, uh, you know, sometimes, you know what, I sometimes like to show you my, you know, show my pets live on the air, and I'm not sure how they're going to react, so um, say hello to uh, my my pet turtle. <laughs> He's really cool. And he makes I love snap. him. Where hey. does he live? Does he live in your tub? He's a snap. He's a snapping turtle. He, he gets out of control. Oh my god! Oh, it's a toy. I thought it was real. No, For it's a not a toy. It's it's a wood carving. Huh. And his head is balanced perfectly. He's just got a great paint job, doesn't he? That is so cool. Oh, he, he is a toy. Around. You were playing with him. And look at his little <laughs> look at his little tail. I love him. He's so cute. <laughs> and the bottom is realistic. It kind of looks like the bottom of a turtle. Yeah. I can't believe tail. I actually thought you had a turtle. I know. I, almost, <laughs> I fool a lot of people. I go, ah, ah, ah. Anyway, let's see. What else? Uh, That's pretty oh, cool. Maybe, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you short, Drew, unless you got something super fantastic. Unless you have a Here real turtle. <laughs> Finishing up. On these cigar silks, these, these used to come in cigar packages, oh, and this cool. is ma mounted on linen behind lucite. Really nice, all the flags of the world, guys. Very hey, colorful. That, that's that's quite the piece there. It just goes on and on and on. Look how big it is. See, I just need to come visit California. I couldn't live there, but I, I just need to come visit. <laughs> oh, you could live here once you get here. <laughs> Look at these silks. They're beautiful. They're so colorful. Every, you know, I don't have every country, but some flags represented there. No, after, after being yeah. in Seattle for for a week, Drew, and seeing more people on the highway than live in my entire county, I, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, maybe that would be a little scary for you. <laughs> well, that's it. I that's awesome. It.
Hope you've enjoyed it. Oh, go check out one of my videos. I just loaded it. Uh, it's a really cool video, so go check that out. And uh, yeah. Yeah, make sure you throw some comments in the YouTube uh, chat. That way people can subscribe to your channel. Sure. Same thing with you, Elena. All right. I've been talking in the chat. Great. Well, thank you, Drew. Well, I thanks for moving on me. to. Uh, I you know showed I love, these I wings to last that. week. I love to. I love to show you guys what I find. Can I'm you, addicted. I'm addicted they, to it. Are they coming in? Uh, oh yeah. Okay. So I showed these to you last week, and I just wanted to do a little. Uh, I guess a little history lesson behind them. So let me do a the, the little explanation about the history behind the parachutist badge, and then I'll get into showing some examples. So, uh, sorry, I'm scrolling through my notes. <laughs> All right, so the symbolism is the wings suggest flight. And together with the open parachute, symbolize individual proficiency and parachute qualifications. This is coming from uh, the the heraldry site, where they uh, keep track of all the history behind the, the army awards and badges and stuff. And um, so it was approved 10 March 1941, with the senior and master parachutist levels coming along in 1949. And those are you know, just more jumps, and they go through some other classes and things like that. So that's uh, just a little bit of history behind them. Um, let me see. Get this set up for pictures. Sorry, I'm trying to get a screen share going here. <laughs> so I just want to show some... Uh, some different ones, and, and as uh, guys get combat jumps, they'd add stars to the uh, to the badge itself. So is that is that sharing now? Yeah. yeah. All right. So obviously, you know, one star for for each jump, and they're going to be a bronze star. They'd have to drill a hole or punch a hole in order to add them to the badge, and then um, once they reached five combat jumps which I believe would probably be unheard of except for probably World War II, Korea, um, maybe Vietnam, but the, the, the combat jumps really started to become limited. So for some, to meet somebody with five jumps would be pretty outstanding. But then it goes into a gold star. So, and that's the, uh, you see the star with the wreath on the top, that would be the... Uh, the master level. So when you start getting into World War II, and this is a borrowed photo, I don't own this. I just want to mention that so somebody doesn't think I'm trying to piggyback on their stuff. You see the arrowhead device in the middle, and that's for an evasion. That means that they did a an initial combat jump. Uh, I had to check the history. I believe this this individual jumped into Normandy. Spearhead. Yeah, yeah, it's an arrowhead, is is what it is. You'll see this on on wings. You'll also see this on um, uh, tour ribbons for or campaign ribbons. So for like the European campaign medal and stuff like that, you'll see an arrowhead. That means that they did a a combat invasion or landing. So the guys like that stormed the beaches in Normandy, they were all issued an arrowhead for their for their service. And I've got one more to show. Let's see. There we go. And this is the uh, the airborne background. I'd have to look it up to see what unit this is, but while they're currently assigned to an airborne unit, they would have a, uh, a, a cloth background denoting what unit they belong to. And as you can see, this individual had uh, 
two combat jumps. And this is, uh, again, it's a World War II era wing. So, just a little bit of history behind the uh, the pair of shoes badge that I showed last week. Uh, it's still currently issued. It's just no longer pinned back. Everything has gone to clutch backs now. So, that's all I have for this week. It was, you know, short and sweet. <laughs> uh, Brian, do you want to do some shout-outs for some of the other shows? I know everybody's taking a break, but it's uh, I still want to at least recognize them and throw their name out there. All right. Well, the shows that I believe are that are going to be on break until, well, yeah, next year. Uh, that would be the Meet and Greet. Our show, Pickers Church, uh, Toadcast is still taking a break. Um, Eric, you've already announced your schedule, I believe, at the beginning of this show. Uh, the only one I think is really up and running right now, and I've seen Paul has done it out there in the chat, will be the resellers wake up in the morning from 9 to 11 a.m. on East Coast time. And... It's like it'll be Monday through Wednesday for the next two weeks, and it's taking Thursdays and Fridays off. That's for the next two weeks. And I think that is about it for the shows right now. Yeah, it seems like everything's getting busy for the holidays. Why and one, not, thing, just... one, one thing to, to mention to everybody, though, is that the, your the Facebook page for Collector's Catacomb um, you know, it's it. I, I was on it this week, and there's some people posting some pictures of like the military uniforms or stuff that they may not know anything about or want to learn a little bit more about. And you know, we don't do appraisals or anything, but we can help people find, you know, the history of the items that, or identify items that they have on there. So anybody who's not a member of that. Uh, look for the, cata the the collector's catacomb on Facebook and. Uh, Sign up there, join it. Yeah, for sure. It, you know, and it's I, I definitely I support the Reseller Society. Uh, I'm an active member over there. Um, I'm also on the Thrifting Lounge as well. But uh, the Collector's Catacomb is there just because it's a lot quicker to go there and and see what's going on as far as updates and stuff like that. And uh, I'm also going to try to release a couple of short videos. Um, the next couple weeks just so there's some new content still being posted and we're not completely stagnant so the only other thing that we have left for the evening is our big winner which I'm trying to pull up now for the uh, the second giveaway from last week's show oh woohoo we're doing it now yeah. I, I haven't logged into that mystery account you guys claim I have. Oh no, no, not this one. This is for last oh, week. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was gonna you have, say, a, you have a week. You have a week, Elena, to get no. your account going. <laughs> you gotta go against my evil twin on that one. Right. <laughs> so let's see. Sorry, my computer's kinda lagging. It's not very happy with me at the moment. Suffering from jet lag. Something. It's weird. I mean, it seems like my internet's actually slower here than it was in Washington. <laughs> so let's see. And all right. And it looks like it's going to be. Kim, was it Kim Fotlin? I think she was watching tonight. Yeah, she was on earlier. She goes by another name in the groups, too. Another last name. Well, she's our big winner for the second giveaway. Woo, woo, woo! Congrats, Kim! So Kim will have to get a hold of us, and I'll get all the, all the prizes shipped out. Um, I know I, I, I slacked up on that a little bit, but... I, I promise I won't send it COD. So, 
<laughs> and then uh, again for the uh, the camera giveaway from from Dan, we will uh, I'll sh release a short video next Thursday on Christmas announcing the winner for that. So get your comments on the video after we go off air. Um, I'm sticking around for at least another 30 minutes. I, I believe most of my panel members will as well. So if you want to come into the, the hangout afterwards and ask some questions or share some items off, that's great. Um, like always, the only thing I ask is once we hit 10 people that uh, somebody politely jump out until it, it reduces down in numbers just to make sure new people have an opportunity to come in and talk to us all. So that's that's the end of the show. We'll see you guys again in in two weeks. Um, don't know the guest yet. Hopefully I'll have it lined up, but it's going to be the 8th of January. Same time, 9.30 to 11. Seems to be working out well for everybody. And hopefully we'll have a full panel back then. So, uh, yeah, I'll post the link in the, uh, the Reseller Society and on the Collector's Catacomb for the after show hangout. Thanks yeah. for tuning in. Hey, Hi, thanks, love everybody. you guys. Happy Bye. holidays. Thanks, guys. Merry Christmas. Keep on.